Well, good morning, Wyatt Park Christian Church. You guys are a social bunch today. I didn't know if anyone was actually going to make their way in from the friendship area this morning or not. Well, good morning. Um, if you're a first-time guest with us, my name is Aaron Michaud. I'm the pastor to youth and young adults here at the church. Uh, we have these uh, little purple cards in the uh, front or back of the pew, I should say. Uh, if you would fill one of those out, uh, you can take it back to the welcome desk uh, right outside of the sanctuary here, and we have a gift for you. Um, if you don't want that gift, you could just drop it in the offering plate uh, during communion as well. Um, we have a couple of opportunities uh, to just be generous uh, this holiday season. Uh, we are collecting uh, money for inter-served turkeys, and so $30 buys a meal for a family of four. And uh, in the hall there, you'll see uh, a little paper turkey up on the wall for everyone that the church has already purchased. And I think there was, well, I counted 19 earlier in the week, but there's probably been more uh, that gone up there. So already, thank you for being awesome. Uh, we also are taking donations for Jacob's Toy Box. Again, if you would like to give to either of those, uh, you can just earmark a check and drop it in the offering plate uh, during communion. Um, if you would like to give new toys to Jacob's Toy Box, there is uh, out in the friendship area a big old tote uh, where you can drop new toys for that as well. Um, Tableau is fast approaching, and so we have a variety of uh, volunteer opportunities there. Uh, Sign-ups are in the social hall or online. Uh, and so again, if you'd like to help set up or tear down or be a part of the live nativity, uh, feel free to choose whatever uh, volunteer opportunity you'd like. Uh, ladies Bible study this week is canceled Tuesday uh, for funeral meal preparations. Uh, again, just be praying for the families there. Um, and so Tuesday morning Bible study uh, will be canceled. Um, this Friday was Veterans Day. And so if you are a veteran, could we ask you to stand this morning so we could honor you? Church, give them a round of applause. <laughs> Amen. Thank you all for your service. Am I passing it to you? Oh, that's right. Jackson Ball has, uh, I mean, it's been a long road. He is now part of the Air National Guard. Is, is he here? I thought he was song. He's back there. All right. Uh, but yeah, if you see him, congratulate him, because I know that was a long journey. And uh, again, we can celebrate that uh, he's, he finally is doing what he really feels the Lord was leading him to do. Amen. We're, oh, we're good there. All right. Well, in that case, how about everybody get up on your feet and let's worship together this morning. Somebody today. 
24 through 28. For I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you from all countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will then then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people.
Shall we pray? Our Father God, we come to you this morning and we lift up our praise to you. We do adore you. We love you. We come on bended knee with raised hands and open hearts. And Father, I'm thankful for each person who's here today, and I know that each one of us brings something different, something that's concerning us, something that's on our heart. Lord, I pray for every person, and I pray that your presence can be felt. I pray that your loving arms will just wrap around us, and whatever it is we're feeling, thinking, or worried about, Lord, we give it to you. We sing your praises. We are so thankful for the many, many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We're thankful for this church. We're thankful for the ministries that occur because of you and our love for you, Lord. Help us, Father, to do more in the name of Jesus. Help us to be the light in this community that so desperately needs you, Lord. And Father, this morning I especially want to pray for the family of uh, Marilee Shawls. And God, we just wrap our arms around them. And we pray that as they grieve, Lord, that they will grieve like believers do in knowing that there is hope that one day soon we'll see Marilee once again. And God, for others who are grieving, we lift them up. And for those who are hurting, we pray for them. We pray for the children of this community, Lord. And we are so thankful, God, for people who come to their aid and we just lift them up, Lord, whether it's the teachers, the counselors, the social workers, first responders, whoever it is, Lord, we pray for them. And now, God, with prayers that are on our hearts. We're just going to pause and have some quiet time and let you lift up your prayers. The people in this building, just pray now, Father. Pray to your Lord. And together, let's close with the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A memorial, as the term implies, is about remembering. A memorial is established so that generations to come will not forget something very, very important. Remembering world change and remembering the events that occurred are important. Some things must never be forgotten. And as we honor our veterans this morning for the service, I do believe it's important for us to not forget the sacrifices that were made and are still being made by the people who serve our country. And so now as we turn our attention to this table, this too is a memorial. It is one that must not be forgotten either. And so as you come to this table today, please think about the freedom that we have to worship in this house, but also give thanks for your freedom from sin. Our sins were placed on one man's shoulders. He carried them to the cross where the ultimate sacrifice happened. 
Let us pray. Father God, may we never forget that sacrifice that was made on our behalf. And as we come to this table this morning to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup, Lord Jesus, we give thanks. We thank you, Father, for sending your son to die in our place. And it's with that we pray, amen. If you're visiting with us today, I want you to know that you are welcome to participate in this Lord's Supper, this memorial, this Thanksgiving. And the way we do it here is we come down the center aisle and there will be servers up here. One will drop a piece of the bread into your hand. And if you prefer gluten-free, we'll also have gluten-free items for you to choose from. Then if you wish to take the bread and dip it into the cup of juice, you can do that. Or we'll also have little cups of juice for you to take. It's your choice. We remember the night that Jesus was betrayed. He was with his disciples and Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he gave thanks for it and then he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you eat of it, remember me. And in like manner, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and he gave thanks for it and he said, this cup represents my blood the blood that will be the new covenant the new covenant that is going to be shed for all of you and it is your way your ticket to eternity with god drink it all of you in remembrance of me when we come to this table to eat of the bread and to drink of the cup we do so with christians here in this room and maybe you're watching at home online and you're partaking. And we do this together as a family that represents not only people here today, but people throughout the ages and from all across the world. And we have this one thing in common, the mystery of faith. Let us proclaim it now. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Please come to the table.
ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning, church. So, Pastor Aaron pointed this out. He said to celebrate Pentecost and wear red during chief season and say it's for Pentecost. It's kind of like cheating. So, um, <laughs> If you got the memo, um, you know, obviously we, we didn't mention it last week, but I sent out an email, uh, a weekend worship email. Check that email out when you get that, because I put little notes in there from time to time to see who's reading it. Uh, and if you're, not getting, if you're not getting the weekend worship email, just let us know, and we will include you in that. We'll make sure to get your email address as a part of that. Uh, before we get going with the message, you can see we have these boxes here from the Samaritan's Purse. Um, this is a mission that our church has been doing for a number of years, and I wonder if, if anyone from the crew that's been assembling these boxes is here, would you just stand up for just a moment? Any of our uh, Operation Christmas Child crew, anyone in here? Either they're shy or they're going to be here for 1045. Anyways, we're, we're, we're thankful for, for what they do, and, uh, but these boxes are all going to be shipped overseas, and real boys and girls are going to receive these, these boxes. And there are gifts and all sorts of things in there, hygiene products and things that, that they need. And um, this is just a representation of God's love for them in a little box. And so we're going to pray for these. I'm going to just invite you as we do, just kind of stick out your hand towards these boxes as if you're touching them. And let's pray that God would use these boxes to share his love with kids all around the globe. Gracious Lord, we thank you for every boy and every girl uh, in every country where Samaritan's Purse will go, where they're going to make these deliveries. Lord, these we don't know what kids are going to receive these, what kids are going to open them up, but we know real flesh and blood with real stories and real struggles and real joys are going to open these up. And inside these boxes, they may seem just like simple things, but Lord, we know to these kids they're going to represent so much more. And so by the power of your Holy Spirit, let each one of these boxes be a little seed in the kids' lives that would teach them about the love of a God that they may know or maybe they don't know. And so these boxes, and I know all across the world, all across this country, there are churches and organizations that are sending these boxes around. And so, Lord, we send these out with the power of your Holy Spirit and trusting you to do the good work that is going to be done in their lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are continuing in our Time to Feast series this morning, and we are coming up on the Feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot is another, it's the, the Hebrew word for it. Uh, we're going to be reading from a couple of different passages this morning from Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 22, and also Acts chapter 2. So I'm going to invite you to turn to the passages, the Page numbers on the screen are just for the Pew Bibles, so if you're using those, feel free to use those page numbers there. And when you find both of those passages, just put a finger in between, in between them, as we will just read one after the other. Leviticus chapter 23. And this is a passage that explains just the very basics of the command to celebrate uh, the Feast of, of Shavuot. And so let's begin chapter 23 and verse 15. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath. And then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves made of two-tenths of an ephah of the finest flour, baked with yeast, as a wave offering of first fruits to the Lord. Present with this bread seven male lambs, each a year old and without defect, one young bull and two rams. They will be a burnt offering to the Lord, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord, then sacrifice one male goat for a sin offering and two lambs each a year old for a fellowship offering. The priest is to wave the two lambs before the Lord as a wave offering. 
Together with the bread of the first fruits, they are a sacred offering to the Lord for the priest. On that same day, you are to proclaim a sacred assembly and do no regular work. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. And when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you, for I am the Lord your God. Now let's turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to read, begin reading here in uh, verse 1. And this is a passage, so this is many thousands of years later after this command was given to celebrate the Feast of Shavuot. And here on the day of Shavuot, this, this feasting day after Jesus had ascended, this is one of the stories of the happenings, uh, and we call it the day of, of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our, in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up to the eleven, and he raised his voice, and he addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when Pastor Aaron began our feast series a, a few weeks ago, he started with Passover, and he took us back to Genesis 1 as we are reminded that when God created the heavens and the earth and put the sun and the moon in its place, God did that to remind us that he wanted to get together. God wanted to have these special seasons, we say seasons, um, but it also could mean uh, festivals, feasts, moments where God says when you see the suns and the, and the moon and the stars, when, when they align in this way, it's time to come together and to remember what I have done for you, my saving acts throughout history. And so there are three pilgrimage feasts in the life of Israel, where if you were an able-bodied male, you were required, no matter where you lived at, you were required to take your offerings to Jerusalem and present them to the temple. And the first of those feasts was Passover, which Pastor Aaron talked about on our very first week. Uh, last week, uh, we talked about or this week we're talking about Shavuot, which is the second of those pilgrimage feasts. And then next week, Pastor Aaron is going to talk about Sukkot. Uh, and so that's another feast where if you, no matter where you lived, you were required to make the trek to Jerusalem with your offerings um, and take them to the temple as, as, a, as a giving of thanks to God and as, as a time to pause, to feast, and to celebrate what God had done in the life of, of Israel. Now, the, the word Shavuot means weeks, and the idea behind that is after Passover, after the, the Passover festival, there was to be seven weeks that were counted down until you got to Pentecost, got to Shavuot, right? And so the idea that, uh, of Shavuot meaning weeks, it was just this idea that you're counting down to the next festival. Now, we know this festival, as I've said a few times today, we call it Pentecost. From the, from the Greek, it just means 50 and that comes from our, our reading from Leviticus 23, 16 today, where at, during the Passover festival, they were to count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, 
and then they were to go and present their offering at the temple. So it's not unlike, some of you probably going to have some sort of a advent calendar, right? Maybe a chocolate advent calendar. Um, there are all sorts of different advent calendars that you might have. I know some people do like a wine advent calendar or a beer advent calendar or a hot chocolate, yeah, whatever it might be, right? So we, we know what it is to, to mark off the seasons and to count down the days to the next feast. And so last week we talked about the first fruits offering that was taken during the Passover feast, and that's when uh, the Israelites gave thanks to God for the early barley harvest. And, and so now we are at the point, the Pentecost, 50 days later, they, the, the Jerusalem pilgrims and those who are going to the temple are coming to the temple with their wheat. So 50 days later, the wheat harvest has presented itself. And so the earliest celebration of Shavuot for the Jewish people was, in essence, a agricultural feast, right? Much like when we think of Thanksgiving. We, we think back to the, uh, the story of Thanksgiving and the successful harvest that the first pilgrims had, gathering with, with the natives of, of the land, and they enjoyed a wonderful feast. But in the time of Jesus, the celebration of Shavuot became more synonymous with God giving the law to Moses. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai and God gave him the, the Ten Commandments, in Jesus' day, that was the primary celebration of Shavuot, was giving thanks to God for the law. Now, that doesn't sound, does that sound exciting to you? Yay, God gave us the law, right? And I can just see the excitement on your face right now. Um, <laughs> but think about it in, in these terms. The Israelites were oppressed in subhuman conditions for 400 years. They were slaves in Egypt. They were, their, their worth was, was based upon how many bricks they made for Pharaoh, right? And so 400 years of, of hardships, they heard the stories of their ancestors, of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. They heard about this God that covenanted with their ancestors and said, I've got a land for you. I'm giving you a land flowing with milk and honey. They heard about this God who said, you're going to have descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. And so after 400 years of oppression and slavery, you have to wonder, they're, they're thinking, where is, where is this God of, of our ancestors? And so the Israelites living in Egypt would have been surrounded by all of these foreign gods that the Egyptians worshipped. And so they would have been wondering, like, well, what about, what about our God? What about the God of our ancestors? Where is he? And so the Israelites' identity as God's special and chosen people might have seemed to be waning just a little bit 400 years into slavery. And so in the Exodus, God sends Moses into, into Egypt to, to, to release them from, from slavery. And a big part of what Moses did was not only to challenge the gods of Egypt and to show the Israelites that their God was the one true God, uh, but a big part of what God had called Moses to do was to introduce his people back to their God and say, this is your God, your God loves you, and this is what your God wants of you and how you are to live your lives. So the giving of the law to Moses was not about God being just a killjoy who just wants to squash everybody's fun, giving a bunch of rules that he knows people aren't going to be able to keep, keep perfectly. And so think about the giving of the law in, in this context. Back in the 90s, there was a uh, lineup of, of shows on Friday nights on TV. It was called TGIF. Right? Anyone remember TGIF? Thank God it's Friday. Um, and th so in, in, for, for my, my generation, sort of millennials, older or younger uh, Gen Xers, if you went to school on a Monday and you didn't do two things, you had nothing to say. And so if you missed TGIF on that Friday, you had nothing to say. You just had to take the word for it from your friends. Uh, or if you missed going to the skating rink. So it was either watching TGIF or going to the skating rink that you had to participate in if you had something to say on Monday. Now, over the years, TGIF switched out shows just according to ratings on how they were doing, but my favorites were, uh, it was Full House was one of them, uh, Family Matters, because I was a big Steve Urkel fan, uh, Step by Step was another one, but my all-time favorite show on TGIF was Boy Meets World. There's a picture of the, the family there, Boy Meets World, and it, it basically chronicled the life of this boy named Corey Matthews. It, it followed all of his relationships with his, his family, with, with girlfriends, with his teachers, and with his best friend, Sean. And it followed them from elementary school all the way to college. Now, Corey's best friend, Sean, was the troublemaker type. 
Corey, I mean, if you think about the two characters, Corey, he came from a home where his parents were married. They were middle class, living in suburban Philadelphia. He had an older brother and a sister. His parents had good jobs. Corey was sort of the model student, right? And so then you get to Sean. Sean was the opposite. Sean lived in a, in a rundown trailer park. His, his mom at some point had left his family. His dad was always working. He was hardly ever home. And Sean was, can you guess, he was the troublemaker, right? So Corey is the one who follows the rules. Sean's the troublemaker. And much of, throughout the entire uh, show, throughout the series of, of shows, Corey was either getting Sean out of trouble or getting into trouble with, with Sean. So in one of the later seasons, Corey and Sean are in college and Sean was dealing with the difficulties of lo losing his dad. His dad had just passed away, and it's Christmas time, and so Sean sort of turned to, to drinking some alcohol, so, some really strong alcoholic drinks, and his friends started to notice it, and his girlfriend noticed it, and they, they confronted him about it. And Corey's dad comes up to Sean and says, you know, Sean, you really shouldn't be drinking. You know, you, you just need to lean into your family and friends because we're here for you. And so there's a moment where, where, Sh where Sean says to Corey's dad, he says, you can't tell me what to do because you're not my dad. And then he sort of storms out, storms out in this dramatic fashion. And Corey goes later on to find his friend Sean. And Sean is sitting in a cemetery by his dad's grave with, with a bottle of liquor. Now, in the closing scene of this episode, Sean goes back to Corey's house. He's having a conversation with Corey's dad. And, and uh, you know, Sh Sean's in, in college at this point, And Corey's dad has sort of been a dad for him. And there's this moment where Sean says, or he asks this request of, of Corey's dad. He says, yell at me like you yell at Corey. So yell at me like you yell at Corey. To which then... Corey's dad says, Sean, you, you, you shouldn't be drinking. Again, you need to lean into your family and friends uh, that are here for you in this, in this difficult time. And so I, I think back to that episode because the question is, what was Sean longing for when he goes to Corey's dad and he says, yell at me like you yell at Corey? He was longing for this identity that comes along with being the member of a family, of being a part of a family that has rules right that has boundaries that are intended to lead a family and and those who are in the family to harmony and peace and growth and love and so might we think of god's laws to israel in the same way might we think of god's laws to israel in the same way in essence god was saying this to his people he was saying in this family i am your creator you are not fatherless you are not orphans on this earth and so I want you to honor me as your source, right? And so we get to the Ten Commandments where, where God is, in essence, saying, in this family, you're going to take one day and you're going to rest from your labors because you're no longer making bricks for Pharaoh. Your identity is not based on how much you do for Pharaoh. In this family, we're going to honor our fathers and mothers. In this family, we're not going to harm one another physically we're not going to hurt each other with our words or with our greed or with our lust right and so that's the ten commandments right god is saying in this family in this covenant family these are the ways that we are going to live and so perhaps we can think of the giving of the law as sort of the adoption of a son or a daughter or who, who's brought fully into a new household as a full member of the family, without distinction, right? And they're given this opportunity to flourish with the rest of the family members with a sense of true belonging, a sense of healthy boundaries that are supposed to, to ground us in, in wisdom and in love and grace. And so God was saying to the Israelites who were coming out of Egypt with this sort of identity crisis, you are my people and I am your God. In this family, this is how we are going to do things. And if anyone needs a family to come and belong to, then come and join us. Come and worship this one true God, for this is how we do things in this family. And so in our reading from Acts this morning, Acts chapter 2, the setting is in Jerusalem during the Shavuot feast. 
And so many thousands of pilgrims have gathered from around the world in Jerusalem. They've traveled from far and wide, and they're bringing their offerings to the temple, and they're celebrating this late wheat harvest and giving thanks to God for the giving of the law, right? For, for giving us a family, for giving us these boundaries for which we might find our identity. And so in this point of the story, Jesus has already risen from the dead. Easter has happened. Jesus has ascended to heaven, and he told his disciples, he said, now when you go to Jerusalem for this Shavuot feast, he says, you're going to receive a gift. I'm leaving, but I'm going to leave you a gift, and it is the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't have enough time to do a full exhaustive study on what the Holy Spirit does for us and the, and the meaning of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Perhaps we can do a, a sermon series later in the future on that. Um, but today what I want to do is just concentrate on the connection between the, Holy, the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost that we read in Acts chapter 2 and the celebration of God giving the law to the people of Israel. Now, the story in Acts 2, it sounds bizarre uh, as we hear of this mighty rushing wind, as it, it, there was this prayer meeting going on, and this mighty rushing wind comes, and there's this appearance of what looks like these tongues of fire that are resting on everybody in the room. So I'm going to simplify this just a little bit and say that there was a divine energy that was felt in that meeting of believers. Have you ever been in, in a worship meeting where there was a divine energy felt, where you felt the Holy Spirit in a real and tangible way? Perhaps it was something like that, but it, it came in the form of this mighty rushing wind and, and, and what looked like to be these tongues of fire resting on people. And, and so it was this divine energy. God's very spirit was unleashed on the people, or we might say God's spirit was poured out on the people. And in, in one, one of the things that happened to these people in the, the prayer meeting when the Holy Spirit was poured out on them is they began to speak in these other tongues and these other languages. Now, remember, there were Jews from all over the world who were in Jerusalem, and they heard this commotion going on. Perhaps they, they heard the, the sound of the wind. Perhaps they heard the sound of all of this commotion of all of these people speaking and talking in different languages. Now, the, the disciples... Jesus' disciples, they were from Galilee, and Galileans didn't have the best reputation amongst the city folk. In fact, um, if, if you were in Jesus' day, and you lived in the city, or you came from somewhere in uh, that region, and you heard a Galilean speak, perhaps you would have said, you're not from around here, right? I mean, just hearing a person speak, you can tell you're, you're from other, <laughs> you're not from the city, you're from other parts, right? And so you could tell someone was from Galilee just by listening to them. And so then in our passage that we read this morning, uh, there's all of these pilgrims that are in Jerusalem. And they hear, it's like they, they, they hear the Galilean talk, the, the Galilean, you might say, accent, and they're speaking in all of these foreign languages. And so they, they ask, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native tongue? They're just bewildered that these people who shouldn't be able to speak these other languages are empowered to speak languages. And so they're saying, what is going on here? What is happening? And in the passage, of course, some people conclude, well, they're drunk, <laughs> right? And Peter says, no, it's too early for that. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. And so Peter stands up at that moment as the people are asking, what's going on? What is this phenomenon that is happening in Jerusalem? And Peter says that this was the divine fulfillment of what the prophet Joel spoke about hundreds of years before, where he says that God was going to pour out his spirit on, on sons and daughters, on all flesh, and that they would speak and that they would prophesy the good news of, of God. And so listen to the conclusion of Peter in Acts 2, 37 through 39. This is sort of, as Peter's giving this first Jesus sermon, this is his altar call. This is what he says. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and, and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so 
Peter gives this, this altar call in essence. People are asking, what's going on? And Peter says, this is the Holy Spirit that's given from God. And, and, and what you're to do in light of this good news that's being shared is you are to repent. First thing is you're to repent. The Greek word for repent is metanoia. And it means to change your mind. It means to think differently. It means to reconsider something. Have you, have you ever changed your mind about something? Have you ever reconsidered something in your life? And so in this instance, repentance means changing your mind about what? Or changing your mind about who? Change your mind about Jesus, right? In Peter's context, many people probably came to Jerusalem and they heard about Jesus. They heard about his miracles. They heard about his crucifixion. They heard that he possibly might have risen from the dead, but coming from these weird-sounding Galileans, how much, are, how much uh, truth are you going to put in what these Galileans are saying? Perhaps they must be drunk, or they're just crazy saying that this Jesus had risen from the dead. But Peter proclaimed that, no, it is true, and he says in Acts 2, 32-33, that God has raised Jesus to life. And he says, we, we are all witnesses of it. And he's been exalted to the right hand of God. Peter says that Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. Now, understand this. For him to say that would have been a big deal because the, the, the Greek people, the, the Roman people, they believed that the Caesars, when they died, they were the ones who had ascended to the right hand of God. In other words, they're saying that the Caesars... They're powerful. What they say and what they do matters, and you better listen to them or else. And so in this instance, Peter is saying that Jesus has been raised, and he is at the right hand of God. So Rome crucified anyone who dared to defy what Caesar said or to defy any of his edicts. And so we remember that Jesus himself was crucified. The state and the church, they conspired to, to kill him and and then some thought that that was the end of the story. Some would have said, well, Jesus, yeah, he was revolutionary, but he was, he was crucified. And so Peter and the rest of the disciples come along and they say, that's not the end of the story. Change your mind about this Jesus. In fact, this Jesus who you think has been crucified and who, who was gone, he's not just alive, but he is at the right hand of God. He is in charge. He is establishing a whole new kingdom and the, the, what, what you are to do, what Peter says to the crowd, your response to this news is to submit to Jesus as your Lord. Change your citizenship. Leave the darkness of your own futile ways of selfishness and greed and pride and lust and fear and come and live in God's kingdom of love and light. That was the invitation. Repent. Change your mind. Make Jesus first in your life and then be baptized. Repent and be baptized. On this Veterans Day, I wonder how I might compare baptism to going through boot camp. How many of you have been through boot camp here? We've got some boot campers here. We, we saw our veterans stand up earlier. You know that you won't survive boot camp without changing your mind. Am I correct? If you go to boot camp and you think you're just a civilian and you can do things the way that you want to do them, you're probably not going to get very, you're not going to get past day one. We'll just put it that way. Um, you have, when you go to boot camp, you, you say, hey, I'm submitting to a new authority. From the very beginning, you leave behind your personal belongings and you receive a new uniform, right? You take off your jeans and your t-shirt, your sneakers, and you get a uniform. You lace up your boots. When you first go to boot camp, there are a lot of personal losses, right? You give up a lot of things. You give up a personal sense of autonomy, uh, of living according to your own schedule, living a self-centered life. And if one person mess up, messes up, guess what happens? Everybody pays for it, right? At least early on in boot camp. If one person messes up, you realize that, hey, man, we're, we're all connected in this thing. And if one person does something wrong, then the rest of us are going to have to work it out. So you learn the value of, of teamwork, right? They put you through these obstacle courses where you realize that you may be the most fit person in the world, but going through this obstacle course, you're not going to be able to get through it unless you accept the help from somebody else. 
and then offer that help to the person who's coming after you. In boot camp, you don't wake up when you feel like it, right? In boot camp, you don't just eat when you feel like it. You don't walk at your own pace. You march in rhythm. You run in cadence. And so at first, it's, it's a shock to the system, to say the least, but at the end of the training cycle, right, at the end of 9, 10, 11 weeks, whatever it is nowadays for boot camp, at the end of the training cycle, you have a sense of belonging. You have a sense of, I'm a part of a new family. And it's no exaggeration to say that at the end of, of boot camp, at the end of basic training, many people feel like they're sort of reborn into a new sort of life. In this family, this is how we are going to live. This is how we're going to walk. This is how we're going to talk. This is how we're going to care for one another. In this family, we're not going to leave anyone behind. In this family, we will sacrifice our well-being for the safety of another. In this family, we are going to respect each other and honor our differences instead of being threatened by them because at the end of the day, we're wearing the same uniform. We're wearing the same color. And so that's this idea of repent, change your mind, be baptized, change your allegiance, change your uniform. Baptism is a powerful symbol of, of death and rebirth. It's a powerful symbol of changing allegiances and changing of uniforms. Paul says it this way in Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into his death. In order just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, that we may too live a new life. Peter said, in, in response to what the Holy Spirit did on that Shavuot over 2,000 years ago, he said, repent, change your mind about Jesus, be baptized, put on the clothing of Christ, go down into Christ's death and be risen up to newness of life, and you will receive a gift. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. My friends, the Holy Spirit is God's seal. It's God's mark upon your life. Let me close by illustrating it this way. Years ago, uh, my brothers and I, we were living still at home. I think we were in junior high at the time. Uh, oftentimes... So my brothers and I, we, we, our rooms were in the basement, and we didn't always go to bed when our parents told us to go to bed. Any other kids do that? You know, your parents say it's time to go to bed. We got other agendas, right, other things to do. And so sometimes we'd go to bed, sometimes not. And, and so before my parents would go to bed, they would go downstairs, and they would come and check on us to make sure we were asleep, and there were no shenanigans going on, right? And so one night, my mom asked my dad to go and check on she said, can you go downstairs and check on the boys? And so as they would often do, my dad went downstairs. But this time, he went downstairs, and he had a black Sharpie marker in his hand. And I remember that um, I woke up from my sleep as my dad was hovering above my head, and he took this black Sharpie marker, and he made a check on my forehead. <laughs> my mom said, check on the boys, and so that's exactly what my dad did. <laughs> And so I'll never forget waking up really confused, like, did I, is this a dream, right? And I went to sleep really quick after that, but I was really confused. I woke up the next morning, and I saw my brother, and I see this black check mark on his forehead, <laughs> and it brought me back to waking up in the middle of the night as my dad was writing on my forehead with a marker. And so then I'll never forget, we went upstairs, and my mom saw us, and of course, that's like the ultimate dad joke, when a dad can do something like that, right? When you could just have a groan from your kids and from, from your spouse, um, and so my dad had a good laugh. We all had a good laugh about that. Through the Holy Spirit, God has checked on you. <laughs> Through the Holy Spirit, God has checked on you, my friends, and it's not a wash-away marker. <laughs> it's not a Crayola. It's a permanent marker. You have the seal of the Holy Spirit on you. You belong to him, and we belong to one another. And you were meant to belong, if you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus yet, you were meant to belong to and to find your place in this family that follows after the resurrected Jesus Christ. And so, my friends, as we think about Shavuot, as we think about the work of the Holy Spirit and what, what the Holy Spirit is doing to create us into his 
family, that family that, that draws near to one another, that worships Jesus as, as Lord and takes care of one another. Meditate on this scripture this week. Ezekiel 36. I will give you a new heart. Put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Let me invite you to stand up and let's say that verse together. Ezekiel chapter 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you for creating a family out of a bunch of ragtag individualist folks. Thanks for creating a family out of those who would otherwise seek our own happiness and our own ends. But instead, you've called us to come close to you. You've placed us within the bounds of your love and your blessings where we might flourish, where we might be filled with your Holy Spirit, where we might be given a heart of flesh to replace our heart of stone. And so, Lord, as you are making out of us your family, as your law is refreshing and renewing us day by day, O oh God. May your light shine within our lives. May your light shine in our words and our actions and all that we say and do. We give you thanks for what your Holy Spirit is doing in us and in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, today if anyone has been thinking about following Jesus, if you've never submitted yourself to baptism, to going down into the waters of Jesus' death and rising up to newness of life, of becoming a part of this family of God, I would encourage you to make that decision today, to step out and to say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be filled with his Holy Spirit. If that's you, you want to do that, let me invite you to come forward during the song. You can come and pray with Cindy, myself, or Pastor Aaron. If you don't want to do it during service, come find us after service. If you need prayer for anything else, if you need someone to journey with you going through something in life, uh, let us do that for you today. Let's sing together this closing song.
Charles before she passed away on Friday, uh, and I do this with everybody that I get to see when I think it's the last time that I get to see them. I remind them that they are a child of God, that Jesus loves them, and I mark the sign of the cross on their forehead. I invite you to do that. Go ahead and do that with me. Let's mark the sign of the cross on our forehead. My friends, beloved in Christ, you've been marked by the Holy Spirit. So go now in the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ. Go in the love of God the Father, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.